my entire mindset of solving problems and creating solutions and inventing stuff, it just led me to start formulating my own makeup. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I'm thrilled to have my next guest here. Guests, I should say. Two guests, two sisters. Um, very, very thrilled. So we have uh, Ego and Natasha. As I said, they are sisters, and their last name, I hopefully will not butcher it, but Iwegbu. Um, so hopefully that was right. And they are the Perfect. co-founders, <laughs> awesome, co-founders, CEO and product development of an incredible makeup brand called The Good Mineral. And they were so kind to send me um, some product. Actually, our mutual friend, Sarah Dusick, introduced us, and Natasha is currently in DC, but Ego is actually in Johannesburg, South Africa. So we're so excited to have both of you here today. And as I said, they are sisters. They are the co-founders of The Good Mineral, and they are natural products in all different shades and for all different skin types. And uh, more than anything, I loved their backstory of going from kind of a a different set of a different career um, and basically from the salon business, also from the STEM business. And I just think that more than anything, their backgrounds just show people that if you've got passion and you've got commitment um, and you've got a great idea and a, an awesome product, uh, you can do it. And even if you're sisters, um, that that can be done. So I'm very, very excited to have you both on here today. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Cara. Thank you, Cara. Lovely to be here. Lovely to have you. So let's start at the beginning. So did you two always know that you were going to eventually work together? Definitely not. Uh, no, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> we're actually very different in character. Um, I'm sort of like the extrovert that uh, goes around doing all sorts of uh, social things. And Natasha is uh, has been an, literally an inventor since since the day I can remember. So there's like two years between us. And I remember Natasha sitting inside her special little cupboard, you know, mixing things and soldering iron ironing things and creating things and I was and I used to just look at her and think oh my god she's mad and run out and go and meet my friends so we've got very very different characters so no we didn't think we were going to work and Natasha's a mechanical engineer by training by trade and so you grew up in South Africa not at all we're not South no, African um, no no, no. no. Oh, interesting. Okay, so to take us <laughs> so back. We lived in England. I lived in England until I was eight. Ego was 10. And then we moved to West Africa, which is where our father is from, um, at the ages of eight and 10. Um, and we lived I we lived in Nigeria I until we until I was 14. I guess Ego was 16, and then moved back to London. So predominantly we grew up in the UK with seven years in Nigeria, which, which was really interesting. But now Ego moved to Joburg recently. Okay. Got yeah. it. Got it. And you, and you both got degrees in STEM. So like no. was beauty STEM? always STEM? something? Oh, STEM, STEM the science. Science, tech, right. engineering. Oh, exactly. So mathematics. Natasha did. Okay. She so, is yeah. not in I STEM. Did math <laughs> I, did, not in I STEM. did mathematics. Okay. I did mathematics. And so STEM, I think, is still considered mathematics and, is, and also is. engineer. It's all falls underneath there. So uh, a, yes. a, I guess a newer term a, along the way. But definitely talk to me a little bit about the beauty side of how you guys decided to jump into this. I think the beauty side happened a lot later. It wasn't it wasn't anywhere near our degree times or anything like that. I was I was doing my degree and um but the thing is that I had always felt that I wanted to start my own business. I was always very eager to figure out what I was going to do with my life after the degree because 
if you had left it to me, if I had been born into an entrepreneurial family, I'd have probably started my first business at 14 or something because I really wanted that. So um, I was always looking for what business I would start and it would and it had to be something social. So when I finished my degree, uh, I got sucked into the world of jobs because you know, there was a panic that you weren't going to get employed and students weren't getting employed, graduates weren't getting employed. So, you know, I got into, I got sucked into the fear of that and ended up in my corporate job, which I hated within minutes, literally of starting. And then I had started to get my nails done in various parts of London that were not the coolest parts of London that I loved to hang out in. And I couldn't understand why I couldn't get my nails done where I hang out on Oxford Street or Bond Street, central London. And that's how the idea came to me. I thought, oh my gosh, we need nail bars in central London. That will be my first business. So that's how that started. Of course, it had nothing to do with my degree and there was no part of anybody that was around me in my life that thought it was a good idea. <laughs> but I, but I, you know, it was like a fire was lit in me. The idea was there and I had just had to press go and I was going no matter what. And what was the name of the beauty bars? They were called Nail Haven. I mean, they were like the place to be. And they were in the middle of the coolest department stores. I came up with that idea. If you ever walk into a department store and see an open plan nail bar, that was my idea <laughs> because I was lit. It was literally the first, it was the first, no one else had ever done it. And I, and I thought this, this is where I want to get my nail. I want to get my nails done in the middle of the department store. So I could look around, watch people shop, listen to great music and, you know, and, and have a good time doing my nails, not a boring time, not a can't wait for it to be over and get out of here time. So that's why, uh, I started Nail Haven and I got to six of them, uh, eventually, um, before it all kind of crumbled in my hands. What did you learn from that experience? I learned so much because it was my first business. I was super young. I had no experience. I didn't know how to manage people. I hadn't thought about the fact that it was so staff human intensive and that, that it would be really difficult to scale a service business like that. Uh, to me, I just thought it was like a formula, like mathematics. We'll set up a nail bar. We'll do, get a rotor. You know, we'll put the products there and people will just come sit down and we'll make money and that'll be the end of it. But of course, that's not how it works because mm -hmm. it's human led, which means that people are off sick or don't want to be at work or um, don't do a good job. And, um, and so it became very apparent that it was a difficult business for me to scale. And I had put all my eggs into one basket. I had uh, pitched it to really uh, big brands on the high street. I got into Topshop. We got into Selfridges, um, got into more and more Selfridges. And then one day Selfridges decided that they wanted to do something else with their floor space. And then that was the end of Nail Haven. Wow. Interesting. As I always tell people, like the biggest challenging times are really, that's where you learn the most, right? And those are the best entrepreneurs who can go out and do something and be very, very clear about what they're, how they're going to do things differently along the way. So that's a, it's a great story. So, and Natasha, how about you? Where did you start out? What was your first role? So I'm obviously an engineer and I was always surrounded. I was always in all male environments, but, um, I'm one of three girls. So we have another sister who's younger and it was a really girly household. And we always, um, spent time every weekend, like doing our nails and brushing our hair. And we always had these beauty rituals. And so I really stuck out when I did engineering because I, I think I was the only girl who actually brushed her hair in our class. There were five girls in a class of 80 men, um, 80 boys, if you like. And um, um, I would actually come to class with makeup and, and, I, and I didn't see why I had to, you know, not, I had to forfeit my makeup in order to be an engineer. Like I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to be glamorous and I'm going to be an engineer. And, and that's just, that's just the way it is. And so um, sort of later on, I 
I had always been frustrated with makeup in general um, because in England back then there were hardly any brands for like brown girls like me. And so I would always go to the makeup counter and there were, there was like one brand um, that did a shade that would match mine. And I hated that brand. And so just my entire mindset of solving problems and creating solutions and inventing stuff, it, it just led me to to start formulating my own makeup. I mean, I would eventually do that because I liked makeup and I wanted to keep wearing it. And I would always break out um, from the ingredients in the makeup brands that were available to me. Um, I also couldn't find the colors that I wanted. And so it, it was bound to happen. I would eventually like just make my own. So that's how this journey started. That's how I got into beauty, just to solve problems. It's, it's always been the same for me. I just want to solve the problems that I see around me. I love that. And it's, uh, it's pretty shocking to think that makeup was just a few colors, right? I mean, and, and there were obviously, I think there were probably more lipsticks um, that had different colors. But when you think about the core of, of so much makeup, there were just so many basic ones. And that was, you know, that was it. <laughs> Just a few, yeah. and 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 it's really surprising on many fronts that more and more people didn't think about that. And so, what were the ingredients that you really started thinking about when you were kind of formulating more than anything that a lot of things use that you didn't want to use? So, I think so. The way when it all began, it began with dissatisfaction with color and dissatisfaction with texture. I have sensitive skin and I'm prone to breakouts. Ego has acne um, still, I think. Can I say that, Ego? And um, so we were always very sensitive to ingredients and heavy cakey makeup just um, broke us out. And so when I started to formulate, well, when I, when I first decided to create a brand, I went to manufacturers and spoke to a bunch of manufacturers. And I was shocked when I realized that most of the people in the room were the older males that I was surrounded by in my engineering job. I was like, hold on, I could be at a meeting right now at Land Rover. You guys formulate the makeup? You know, I didn't say that, obviously, but I was I was in a room with older males. And, and the way that they would speak about females was as if we were these silly, silly beings that would accept anything that they formulated. And I remember in one of my meetings, I was actually speaking to the man who had formulated this brand that was like my nemesis. It was like the heaviest, cakiest brand. And he looked straight directly at me and said, you know, women of color like heavier coverage. That's why I formulated this souffle. It's called, it was called souffle. That's why I formulated it like that. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I was so, I was so appalled because women of color in particular don't like heavy coverage. They want lighter coverage. And all women want lighter coverage, but it was the authority with which he, you know, he spoke about this. I was like, wow. So I realized pretty quickly that I wasn't going to get a solution um, by going to an existing manufacturer. Like these guys were not in touch with anything and they were, they were very proud of themselves because they had sold, they were obviously selling oodles of makeup and, and it, it wasn't perfect and they did, just didn't care. So I decided that I would formulate my own makeup. And at that point, um, I had just moved to America. My husband is American. And, and I think that that had a massive um, impact on my ability to actually start making my own makeup because the maker space in America is, was really like amazing to me. Like in England, you couldn't just order ingredients online. You couldn't, you couldn't get hold of things like that. But when I moved to the States, like you Google something, um, and, and yeah, you can find this ingredient, you can find that ingredient. But I mean, the main thing for me was I wanted to find like, what is the ingredient that allows you to create coverage? Like, what is it that allows us to create coverage? And let me isolate that first. And then I can add in the ingredients that I need, you know, to, to do other things. So once I isolated that and I realized that we needed like three or four pigments, 
and you need pigments rather than dyes because dyes are irritating and they're cheap. Um, and pigments are expensive <laughs> and they're concentrated. So I was like, okay, so we need pigments. We need three pigments because, you know, primary colors. We need three primary color pigments. All right, check. And I make sure that those are you know, not derived from animals, that they are gentle and mild. And then what else do we need? You know, and so I, I, I approached it almost like an elimination diet. Um, I didn't add in anything that wasn't completely necessary. And everything that I did add was like really, really pure. And, and I was making it for myself and I was making it for ego. And so it was just, it was really like a no brainer. I was blending the stuff in my kitchen. Um, so there wasn't anything that was toxic that was going to get through my kitchen. I had a toddler, um, a baby, actually, Alexander was a baby at the time. So I was blending the stuff on the kitchen counter together with, with, with what we were eating. And that was how I formulated all of these um, products. So, so little by little. So after I made my shade, then I went out and I found models and there are funny stories about me stopping women on the street that I don't, I didn't know. I was like, please come and model. Just me. based on the color um, of their, just the based on their color. Yeah, yeah. I would see like interesting I complexions and i am like, you've got to come and model for me. And they're like, I'm like, don't be frightened. <laughs> My child will be here. <laughs> that is I used terrible. to bring out the blender it would take six hours, six hours to get. So there, there isn't a single shade that was made in a lab. We didn't, you know, when shades are made in labs, you sort of like have a swatch and then you put it under the UV light to check, to match it with something like I was, I was matching it on a live person, on a live woman. And so we would tweak it and tweak it and tweak it until we got the shade right. And that's how all the shades in the line are made that way on, on live models. I love it. That's that's great. Now, how so you're formulating your kitchen, you're sending product to Ego and then Ego, how did like how did you two decide then, OK, we're going to go make this a company and we're going to do this together? So, I mean, it was really a just a test run. So I had after I had lost uh, my salons in the UK, I, I, did, I turned I became a consultant, salon consultant and ended up writing two books on salon business and setting up various beauty counters for many brands. And so that was what I was doing until I moved to South Africa and then ended up opening two salons here, which was also not the plan, but I ended up opening two salons here and they were really, really, really busy. Um, I mean, the salons that I had in the UK were very popular and actually did really well. But now I had all this experience and uh, learnings. And so I opened up two more salons here with a lot of that experience and a lot of those learnings. So the salons were booming and they were amazing. And we built we built huge amounts of trust with the customer. And um, my mom one day, basically our mom said, Ego, my goodness, these salons are so busy. Why don't you bring Natasha's formulas and, you know, test them and try them on the women in your salon. And I thought, okay, well, let's try that. So that's how it started. So it, it was started, we were just trying it out. And Natasha would send, would blend and would send over the powders and I would jar them on my, my dining room table and we would label them and we would put them out in the salon. And of course, look, at the end of the day, uh, the combination of the grassroots method that Natasha used to create those magic powders is what we call them now because they literally are like magic uh, combined with the grassroots you know method that we use in the salons the fact that we know our customers firsthand we put the product on firsthand over 50,000 faces the combination of that was just just created a, a a truly magical business we would sell out I would call Natasha, Natasha, mix more. Natasha, what? How did you already sell that? It's just sell. It's selling, Natasha. Just mix more. And so we had this crazy sort of 18 months of mix more, mix more now. We're selling out. I would go to parties here in Johannesburg and I would bump into a woman 
who I don't know, mate, she would, she would have bought the product and she'll go, you guys, you guys got me off of my other brand. And now you don't have any caramel three. How can you do that? I need more product now. You know, I'll be like, Natasha, mix more. So that's how it started. People became quickly passionate about it. So you've got your super consumers pretty fast. And that's amazing. So where is the good mineral available today? I mean, how do people buy it? Right. So uh, we we basically recently launched it as a D2C online um, in the United States um, as the good mineral. It is um, 33 amazing powders that Natasha formulated for years. And um, you can find us basically online, which is www.thegoodmineral.com and on our Instagram, where we will color match you if you DM your selfie to us, because we've color matched so many people virtually and in person. Uh, We know our product inside out. And so we're really able to color match people perfectly online. So all you have to do is send in a selfie and then we'll tell you what your shade is. And then you'll use the best foundation you've ever tried in your life. With regards to it being a mineral uh, makeup brand, I think it's really important for people to understand that uh, assuming that all mineral makeup is the same is really not right. Um, it's like thinking that all liquid foundations are the same, which, and we know that that's not the case. So the fact that Natasha created these formulations with that sort of elimination diet, um, idea of only putting in what was absolutely necessary. Um, she has created products that are truly unique and, um, when applied, that's why we ended up, that's why we've, we've ended up with such a cult following out here in South Africa. And that's why even though we only launched three months ago, we've already got genuine five star reviews on our website and through our Instagram. People are absolutely obsessed with it already. Well, it's a terrific product. The foundations and the powder, I tried them. They're absolutely, absolutely amazing. So how do you build a brand, right? I, you obviously launched this during this crazy last couple of years. I mean, how how do you think about building a brand? It sounds like your strategy is to be in uh, your salon and then also build a direct to consumer business. But how do you get the word out about your product? And I think get trial as well, because people need to yeah. try it more than anything. Yeah. How do you do that? Yeah. So, so I think one of the most important things to do with a brand, uh, initially, even from the start is to create trust. Um, and the way to create trust when no one has ever heard of you is through quality imagery and very, very clear information. So one of the things that we did was make sure that, first of all, our packaging and our uh, the visuals of our product are supersonically amazing. They look great. So immediately a person looks and goes, oh, this looks like a real brand. And then you build the most amazing website. You make sure that it's fully functional, which of course these days is quite straightforward, but you make sure that on the website and anywhere where you're talking about the brand, you speak with authenticity and clarity and you really sort of touch on people's pain points. You know, a lot of the pain points are, I hate foundation, don't like the way it looks on my on my skin. It looks like a mask. It feels heavy. We talk about those pain points a lot and we address them through blogs and through the content that's on our website and through the content that's on our on our Instagram, which is our main social media platform. Um, that helps to build trust. And I treat every new follower that we have on Instagram as, as if they're a customer that's just walked into my salon. So, you know, I imagine if I've got 3000 people coming into my salon, then that's bloody amazing. If I've got a hundred people, then that's amazing. One person is amazing. So, so when you're building that that when you're starting a brand, think about the name properly, think about how it looks, and then think about how you're presenting it. Make sure that you present it in a way that allows people to immediately trust you and therefore choose you. And that's how it starts. And then when one person chooses you, you 
you you nurture that relationship. The next person chooses you, you continue to nurture every single relationship through emails, through communications. We never let a DM go by without being answered on Instagram. We never let an email go by without being answered. You know, I literally treat everybody online as though they were real life people in front of me. And I think that that makes a massive difference to how the brand is viewed and how it's growing. Do you think you'll be in stores as well? Is that part of the goal to get into more stores throughout the world? And what do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're just, we're focusing right now on, on visibility, on getting ourselves, uh, seen and heard, uh, getting the cus, getting a few customers. And then once we've kind of built to a certain tipping point, then of course we will be pitching to all the, the right stores we want to be in Alta and Sephora and Carl's and them. everything. That's- all of them. Well, and I, them. I laugh because we've we've interviewed a few different people who have said that they're just going direct to consumer and that's how they want to grow their oh, business. Really? And so, yeah, right. which I think is really interesting. It's not necessarily everyone's strategy, but I think it's it's an interesting strategy for many people. Um, and then there's other people who are talking about iOS and not being able to uh, to track um the consumer going forward Mm. uh and Mm. you know and you know it's it's becomes very very expensive to gain new customers and there's other people who are really kind of moving away from the direct-to-consumer business so i'm always curious Mm. when i talk Mm. to brands um what kind of works for them and i think it really just depends on your margins of your business as well and all of those things too. So I think that certainly for us, one of the, the 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 strategies for this year is to create a variety of events and pop-ups in the States in uh, a couple, well, not a couple, in about five of uh, key states that we're really interested in um, because I think that there is a lot of power in face-to-face, real life, uh, human market, uh, you know, marketing directly to the, to the person, because that always increases your, uh, following on social media. And because the product is so well made and it's so good, it generally tends to get a lot of word of mouth happening. I know it's not in the hundreds of thousands as you would get online, but even if you get 10,000 real life humans that have touched and felt your product and love it and have adopted you as the brand, as their brand of choice, um, then it, then there's a way that it spreads, uh, uh, in, in real life that is very powerful. Have you run into any surprises in launching this brand that you were, you know, whether it's in the packaging or whether it's who your customer is, uh, pricing, is there anything that has really been surprising to you? Not really. I think, I think one of the, one of the shockers that <laughs> lost when we first launched was how expensive it was to, to put ads out in Google and get keywords to, to, to work for you. I remember one keyword, I put out a keyword and a couple of, and, and it came back like, I think we spent almost like a hundred dollars on this one click for this one keyword. And I thought, never, never ever. We are not doing that again. I would rather take my thousand dollars and stand on the street and sell 10 of these foundations to real life humans than spend a hundred dollars paying for that, for that keyword. Major surprise. I think that we've discovered that, um, when you use the word mineral, the word mineral has been used by lots of other brands. So our click, our cost per click was was going to be just too high to absorb. And so we would have to look for other methods that would be less expensive. But the cost per clip, I think, really did take us by surprise. We didn't expect that. But I think that it was because the makeup um, arena is so crowded and the the key um, SEO words are are taken and used by other brands but we still kind of need those words. We can't adopt new ones. And so we have to like look at different strategies. I think in the future, one of the things we might um, do, which will prove to be, which will likely prove to be effective would be to niche down and um, create actual niches 
of users who, um, you know, who have certain pain points. I think by niching down, niching down is the only way that we can sort of overcome um, the click costs that we're experiencing online right now. We have done that. We haven't we haven't uh, ignored that. Like we've kind of really sort of focused on acne prone or people who need um, um, makeup for eczema when they've got eczema and stuff like that. So you kind of really home in on particular segments. Yeah. Amazing. So one of the things that I always ask people is uh, to share a story. You've shared a little bit of, of one already, but uh, if there's a, another story where you faced a big challenge or failure along the way, whether it's with the good mineral, it's still early, you know, another situation where you weren't sure whether or not you were going to be able to go forward, but you looked back on that. And uh, Steve Jobs used to say the dots eventually connect and it helped you to be a stronger entrepreneur today. Oh my gosh. Like challenge after challenge after challenge, you mean? <laughs> you mean, how did you overcome and continue to run? <laughs> to keep going. Loads, yeah, so many, it's... so many challenges, so many challenges. And so many times where you have moments where you just think, okay, well, that's it then. I'm clearly not good enough. Um, or maybe I'm just not smart enough. Or, you know, maybe it's just not for me. Um, there's so many of those. I mean, from, you know, losing the first uh, six salons that I opened um, to issues with staff and losing really good people that were on your, that you thought were on your team and then they're not, you know, there's just pain that happens all the time. In the good mineral, I'll tell you, which is, and we're, we're so young, but yet it's, it's already happened. Um, one of our key employees, um, couldn't come back after her maternity leave. She was expected back in January. And uh, she tells me in at the end of December that she's not going to make it back. Um, and she might come back in six months. But, you know, if I need to find somebody else, then I should. And I and I was gutted. I was really expecting her back. So we're kind of um, scrambling around now trying to find a, a better ops manager. But I think in general, um, I, I have a, a few incidents where you, so you, you, you're trying to go from one point to another, you're trying to expand and get larger. And eventually you realize you have to go to a manufacturer or you have to. So I remember there was once I put in an order for brushes with a manufacturer and I received the samples, which I signed off and I, I liked them. And then when the, um, when the order finally arrived, you open up all these boxes. And at this point you have thousands of units and they're, they're all terrible. And, um, and then you sort of think, well, what do I need to do in the future to stop that from happening? Do I need to just pay more? Um, do I need to find better supply? I mean, obviously I need to find better supplies, but how do I, um, prevent that from happening? And, <clears throat> I typically go back to like my background. I think my background in engineering is very helpful in so many ways because then you realize, oh, that's the reason why we have our spec, our specifications signed off, you know, by six different people at Land Rover. I need better specs. And so there were, there were a few occasions where that happened, where something came back that needed mass production that wasn't arrived in it, it wasn't the correct quality it wasn't the right quality and so putting in like quality assurance systems after that it became very obvious that it's really really necessary to do this um there is no way around it um so yeah i had a I, there was a case like that with jars that happened once and with brushes that happened <laughs> where I got the wrong quality. Has supply chain overall been a challenge for you, uh, especially being yes. a brand new brand? And I always you know, share this with friends who are not in a physical goods business that it's, uh, I think anyone who's in the physical goods business realizes God. that you know this time has been really challenging. And the younger you are as a brand, the less clout um, you have as well, because your minimums are smaller and all exactly. of those things are tougher 
and uh, and also more expensive, right? So you're trying to yes. shift things. Yes, we suffered huge delays, of course, during COVID, with the uh, with the shipment, and we were, we, I mean, we were literally eight months late with our planned wow. launch date. Yeah, as in it was that it was that off. That's crazy, and everybody's dealing with it, and also costs. I know um, at Hint, just as an example, all of our um, all of our components are in the U.S., but yeah. it was as much as thirty percent higher. Um, in it for everything from trucking to shipping to uh, I yes. was speaking to uh, who was it Baraby Baraby the blankets the weighted blankets I had her on and she was saying forty percent um, higher wow. so for her product so I mean it's very very interesting what people are seeing during this time and hopefully those costs actually uh, go down. Do you think um, they'll so, go down, but, Cara? Do you think that people... I don't know. I, that's the worrying part, isn't it? I think that... So COVID, the, the lockdown has presented so many interesting opportunities in a way. So the, the B2C market, the direct-to-consumer market has bloomed because everyone's at home and no one's in stores. And so that's created a massive opportunity. But then on the other hand... Um, I think shipping shipping has gone up. You said forty percent. I think that's about that's about right. And then the delay is at least twelve weeks. Um, with our first shipment, yeah. we experienced what did you say, Ego? Eight, eight, eight months. Eight months off. We experienced yeah. eight months in total. My worry is how do we know whether it'll ever correct itself? Because when when you've absorbed a higher cost, if you've absorbed it as a business and the customer has absorbed it. Um, Will the shipping companies ever revert back to the lower prices? Yeah. Well, there aren't enough shipping companies. I mean, that that's really the biggest issue. Right. So I think that mm, that's, mm. A, you know, it, and I think that they are definitely winning in, in this world at this moment. But I think that there will be. I mean, certainly uh, Amazon in the U.S. has created, you know, they've bought their own trucks. Yeah. They're doing last mile delivery. They're... Yeah. I mean, that is in, ex in exchange for um, paying crazy shipping. And I think more and more, that's what people are looking to do. So I think getting in the warehouse yeah. business um, yeah. across the U.S., <laughs> a good idea. at least across the U.S., but it's probably throughout the world for last mile delivery is, is going to be a pretty decent business. A too. good business. Um, a bit good business to be in. But this is incredible thank you both for all of your time and so much wisdom and wish you both the best of luck and it with the good mineral it's it's absolutely amazing and thanks everybody for joining us on the show we're here every monday and wednesday with incredible entrepreneurs and ceos who definitely show perseverance perseverance and how that can lead to entrepreneurial success and uh, definitely give this episode five stars, uh, download the podcast so that you're able to get it every single week. Like I said, we're here every Monday and Wednesday and uh, shameless plug here. I have a book out, as many of you know, that I launched a little over a year ago called Undaunted that highlights my journey and all the things that I learned along the way. So definitely uh, download it on Amazon. It's also available worldwide on Audible. And last but not least, if you have not tried our products, uh, the sort of core product is Hint Water. Uh, we're not available, sadly, outside of the U.S. Uh, for those who are listening. But when you come to the U.S., and hopefully we will be uh, – setting up opportunities for Hint Water to be sent to lots of other parts, um, hopefully to do last mile delivery in certain countries as well. So stay tuned for that. But thanks, everybody, and have a great rest of the week.